Hey everyone, welcome back to Design Create Inspire. Today I'm excited to bring on Ryan Rosen. Ryan is an architecture student and he has also traveled pretty much the world. It's very inspiring. You will love it. He is bringing his international travels and knowledge of meeting all these different people and communities into architecture. And he discusses how travel and social interaction really affects us and how architecture can basically bridge that gap of creating um, interaction with people and the health of that and all that stuff. We also go into a little bit about being an architecture student right now and um, what that looks like. So enjoy. Hello everyone. Today I have on with me Ryan Rosen. He is a designer here in San Diego and is currently finishing his Master's of Architecture at Woodbury University. He spent his undergrad across the country at Tufts University where he received a BA in International Relations. And luckily he, with this degree, he was able to study abroad in Madrid, London, France, and Venice. And when he finished undergrad, he spent a year abroad volunteering as a digital media instructor in India, which led to a published memoir that reflects on his time teaching. Ryan is currently in his thesis year working on a really incredible topic that is very prevalent and relevant for today. So I wanted to dive into his thesis, but I also wanted to talk a little bit about architecture school and what it's like being a student today. So hello, Ryan, thank you for joining me. Bryn, thank you for having me on. Of course. So before I dive in, I like to just hear a little bit about you and people get to know you a little bit. So can you tell me a little bit about your origin story? Sure. I was born and raised here in San Diego, California. Grew up playing a lot of tennis, was exposed to a sport that had an international component to it. Always thought about travel and what it was like to meet people who were playing tennis and other parts of the world. That brought me to Tufts where I met a lot of new people. And it was a super exciting for endeavor for me. And I started to be very passionate about interacting with others and starting my nascent stages of exploring like what is social interaction. Um, my time studying abroad, it got me, introduced me to travel photography. And that's what led me to India. So there I was teaching digital media and specifically photography at a community center. And it was there that I really discovered and kind of clarified my interest in, and quite frankly, passion for generating social interaction and seeing how us as humans can come together. And that led me to say, hmm, I feel like architecture could be a cool discipline to try and pursue this. Fast forward three years and here I am talking to you about my thesis, which is exclusively focusing on architecture and social interaction. Which it's funny because that's something you were obviously passionate about before, but now with COVID, it's even more prevalent and something that is even more interesting and complicated. So <laughs> I don't know if there's a, I mean, we can go before we dive too much into thesis. First, I want to, so, so you went into architecture school kind of as um, like an after, like once you were being involved with the international studies and everything then that brought you to architecture yeah i went to architecture school my family is in real estate and i had kind of a penchant for development and i've interned in various real estate firms in my life but they were a little boring for me i was kind of more interested in the creative side of architecture not that i don't think development or real estate can be really cool um but yeah i went to architecture without really ever fabricating a physical model before and having little idea to no idea on how to draw I had a, a developed a skill set in photography, but really I was a little new to some of the creativity that architecture took. And I always tell people who may be apprehensive about going to architecture school, I didn't know anything. <laughs> and uh, I've been able to make it somewhat successfully. So yeah, that was kind of my, my pivot to architecture. I never thought I would go to architecture school growing up. I didn't really know any architects. Yeah, you know, that was kind of the same. I grew up in the construction world, but I didn't really think about going into architecture. I just, I guess I didn't really know it was an option. So it's it's yeah. interesting how that's the case. Like, you can always talk about being doctor or even engineer, but architecture sometimes is 
not as known about? It's, it's something I've noticed a little bit about the discipline. Sometimes it can be somewhat insular. So whenever someone talks about rejecting the silos of architecture or interdisciplinary, it always gets me excited. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. Yeah. And I think things are changing too. And there's more, more voices and even Definitely. podcasts, people talking about it and everything. Mm -hmm. So thesis year, um, obviously we had to go virtual. Is that, I know thesis year is sometimes a little bit more independent. So has that been not too big of like an upset or is it, do you really feel the effects of that? I do and I don't. I think I'm already in a bit of a unique situation. I'm the only master student in my year anyways. Oh, wow. So, and I'm also pretty comfortable with reaching out to strangers and trying to talk through, um, unfortunately, digital channels. So has it been fun or helpful? No. But it also has, I think, improved my ability to connect with others through digital channels. And in that light, I actually think I've had a lot of a year of growth because now I have the, the better tools to talk and communicate with people regardless of location. Mm -hmm. so even though I'm a geography nerd, now I'm able to talk to people without the constraints of geography. Yeah, I, I think that's so true. Even, um, you know, getting interviews like this beforehand, it would be like, okay, can we schedule a certain time? And then it's like, oh, Zoom, people aren't so familiar with it. Or I didn't even know about Zoom before Me pandemic. Neither. Yeah. I'm a technological now, dinosaur. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And now it's like, you can connect with anybody. You can talk with anybody. It makes it so much easier. So yeah, in a weird way, it's like, it has this growth to it. Mm -hmm. um, so, so your thesis. So obviously, COVID has had a big effect on architecture, which maybe we haven't quite seen yet, but I notice even in the clients that I'm starting to get, people are wanting more, um, you know, comfortable home workspaces. Uh, even like people are just home all the time. They're like, I, I've been looking at this one area of my house. I hate it. We got to change it. <laughs> and so it's affecting it in that way. Also in terms of like cities, Cities, the, the main landscape of cities is like pretty much big commercial buildings, like offices, whatnot. So I think that might even be changing. Um, but even most importantly is that social interaction. So obviously it's very difficult and we're restricted to really interact socially. Um, and obviously that has a big mental effect on us but I know this is and I'll let you kind of take it how you know explain your thesis a little bit but I I have a feeling that architecture is going to try to um like not fix but help this so that we can safely interact because we as humans need that but maybe you can talk a little bit about um and either would like what got you into this or what kind of issues you're seeing or how we can promote it or I'll just kind of let you run with it. Sure. So I would say first and foremost on the topic of, of, of why social interaction or why is that relevant and why do I personally care about it? So uh, I've always been someone who's interested in, in a wider range of people and, and very open to listening to a diversity of perspectives. And I think that social interaction has a, the ability to really develop compassion between people. So initially, I always think about maybe groups that were conflicting and thinking, oh, I have friends and like, I, I'm, I'm Jewish, but I have lots of great friends who are Palestinians. And I'm like, well, most of my Jewish friends don't have that many friends who are Palestinians. So I was always kind of just in general curious about the potential that interacting with the quote unquote other could do to potentially transform a society and the relationships that are kind of uh, the foundation of a society. Um, and then I think the, the topic of social interaction is even more prevalent today with uh, what I would call epidemic loneliness that's just being amplified by COVID. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, fragmented information channels from like, like the internet's a big deal, right? This is, in my opinion, our, like, a, like a Guten, 21st century Gutenberg revolution. So we have these new ways of communicating to each other that kind of produce some form of fragmented news. And I think that a lot of people could really benefit from just interacting with other humans and interacting with a diverse range of 
perspectives on politics or economics on different cultures. And I'm, I'm just very fascinated by the ability to bring together. And that stems from not just, I think this would be good for society, which I, I fundamentally believe, but a, a personal interest in being very, very, very curious about a lot of people. So I'm, I'm just obsessed with, with meeting new people and talking to them and learning more. That's why I got interested in travel photography. I've come to think of travel as kind of the art of interaction learning how to interact with, with other or new things, whether that be people predominantly for me, but it could be cultures and other stuff. So that's kind of the framework that got me so, so passionate about social interaction to the point where I'm trying to, you know, really be a specialist in social interaction. Um, and I think we as designers and other stakeholders in the built environment have a wonderful responsibility and opportunity to either cultivate social interaction and really give people the tools and opportunity for that to occur. And we also have the unfortunate power to kind of prohibit that from occurring, which I think has happened uh, too often. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of, I would say, the context of which my thesis is looking to operate in. And I'm, I'm super excited to kind of to, 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 to discover it further. Yeah, I think that um, you don't always think of it this way, but architects and urban planners have a way to kind of manipulate that social interaction mm -hmm. through even like the way we design urban spaces like parks and stuff. Uh, you can make it more isolating or you can create these hubs to create this social interaction. And so it's something that I think really needs to be on the forefront of our of our minds as designers, because like you say, we are like, we're creating this built environment for these people to use. And so there has to be some awareness of this. And especially right now with this um, isolation that is increasing, how we can figure out how to do that in a healthy way where people can still have that opportunity to interact. And, or like, you know, I have, family who live by themselves and so in normal times it was fine but right now it's so isolating and there's not sure. this opportunity so if there's this way to have maybe a public space that they can go by themselves but still have some sort of like social interaction i don't know that's difficult but <laughs> And we're at the, you know, we're at the beginning of it all. So, so what are some of the questions, like your main thesis questions? So my thesis is aiming to really, my, the question would be, how can architecture facilitate social interaction? And I want my thesis to address that particular question. So my goal is to, through conversation, observation, and investigation, really try and identify what spatial variables influence or nourish or kind of prohibit social interaction from occurring. And I'd love to be able to, maybe a daunting task, but to codify or catalog those spatial variables and then create a tool, like a kind of a kit of parts or toolkit that other designers or stakeholders in the built environment could easily use as strategies to either retrofit existing buildings and spaces or for future buildings and spaces so that this sort of, um, idea of so social interaction is a, is a civic necessity can be more easily and widely enacted in projects. So it's something I'm very passionate in and it's coming from kind of a background with a real estate family and knowing other people in real estate is maybe how to make this language digest, um, digestible to people mm -hmm. who are not designers, mm -hmm. so whether that be developers or policymakers or community advocates or just people in general. It's kind of, um, my, this thesis is my preliminary attempt at trying to raise awareness to a degree about the significance of social interaction and the potential that it has for our society and having that be realized within the realm of architecture, but seeing if that could also be communicated outside of our discipline. Mm -hmm. Kind of goes back to the not a huge fan of the insular nature of architecture. Exactly, like the Arca speak, like turning, mm -hmm. taking away that vocabulary so that it it resonates with everybody since it obviously does affect everybody yeah like initially I was talking about my thesis and like uh 
how can um, design interventions uh, pro proliferate and disperse typologies and create network effects? And it's like, that, that's cool. I really like it, but I don't think very digestible by many people. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the chief aims of my project. And I hope to do this particularly by my, my methodology will be socially interactively driven. So in my efforts to research, what are the spatial variables that kind of condition social interaction? I hope to, through social interaction, discover some of those. And that will that'll include conversations with people in our discipline, as well as people outside of our discipline. So this toolkit, is it going to be basically like, um, and I know you're at the beginning, I know you haven't fully designed it yet, but the concept, would it be like, have a like certain space, in your building where people can come or how like kind of like that like a spatial type idea yes i think i want to because it's an architecture thesis even though i'm in a very interdisciplinary nature try and really focus on the spatial variables that influence i like to use influence not determine because i'm not sure that spatial variables are the sole factors in kind of the conditions of social interaction but focus on what are the spatial variables that kind of can potentially nourish and guide social interaction in the right direction. And in doing so, I think, I mean, first and foremost, I think most development and most of our spaces are not necessarily designed with social interaction in mind. A lot of times it's kind of, well, we have some leftover space, so like this can be the shared area. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'd like to kind of critique that. And obviously there are, there are lots of amazing architects. I think of Ecosystema Urbano and Belinda Tato or studio gang that do some amazing, amazing work who have been highly influential for me that are trying to cultivate and nourish social interaction. But I think it has a strong ability to grow and be communicated with society at large. So the idea would to be to, to create this kit of parts that kind of mm, easily distills some of the information so that at the very least you can make quick retrogrades or, or um, mm -hmm. renovations or kind of you have some strategies for future developments and designs that maybe just like the random developer could use or mm -hmm. community advocates have a better idea of maybe how you can, what like, oh, I, I know circulation, I'm obsessed with circulation. So I'll try and narrow that down. But like, what are, the, what are the potentials of circulation or thresholds and enclosure? What, what are the spatial variables that we can kind of distill that we can then leverage um, as strategic opportunities to facilitate social interaction? Yeah, and sometimes it's even really little minor changes that you wouldn't really even think about, but can can facilitate that. I was watching, I was doing a virtual architecture conference a couple weeks ago, and the head of Parks and Rec for New York, um, Mitchell Silver, was there, and he was talking about just how uh, they're trying to create more equality within parks and how, you know, New York's filled with parks, but there's some areas that are just, they're just empty and there's no social interaction. And why is that? And there's signs of no loitering, even though it's a park, which is like so backwards. And there's individual seats here and there, or there'll be a bench, but it's not very comfortable because they don't want people to stay because of like crime or because you know the teenagers hang out and there's drugs and all this uh th this uh not necessarily false but these ideas that have then changed the way the parks are used which then also in a way promote this you know crime and that sort of thing so his whole thing is altering this to promote interaction to sit and all all it is is like a new bench setup idea where there's individual seats, but they're all connected. And so people are forced to kind of sit closer to one another. And, but just these little tight, and then these tiny ideas then actually reduce crime because the parks are more filled with families and with people and bringing, not just dis discriminating against your color or your age and telling, you know, teenagers, we do want you in here. Um, and but it's like these little tiny changes that that promote this interaction, which actually make like a much healthier environment. I, I couldn't agree further. Right. Or let's just say you reorient the benches so that some of them are facing each other. Mm -hmm. And that's so, that's a really easy change to make mm -hmm. on a super small scale. But if we can extract those principles and then they can be kind of systematically applied throughout the park system and 
our urban cores throughout the United States, that would have a massive impact, right? Just from reorienting benches potentially. Mm-hmm. And that's not a super challenging thing to necessarily do. So I, I think that it's amazing to see other people interested in a topic that I'm interested in and that there's, exist, <laughs> that there's amazing existing efforts to try and promote social interaction in the built environment, especially right now with COVID, which mm-hmm. is a whole other challenge mm-hmm. um, to safely achieve that. Um, but yeah, that, that's, that's what I'm really excited about looking into. And I think the more that we can, like, that's just one example, right, of manipulating benches and parks. But what about parking lots and box stores? Or how about lobby spaces and luxury developments? Or low-income housing in the east side of New York, right? Or there's a plus, I mean, how about gas stations? How about the DMV, right? There's, there's many, many typologies or different spaces that we can, that are opportunities to cultivate social mm-hmm. interaction. I think that's so exciting. Mm-hmm. There's so many spaces where there's, there's opportunity to kind of, uh, implement these social objectives Mm -hmm. yeah it's true it's not like you have to reinvent the wheel but like i mean opportunity i think is the key word because dmv like you say it's already there there's hundreds of them but if you can create maybe a new typology or or just a new idea of what that looks like you you could it, it could increase health happiness i mean that's the whole point of our architects is we're supposed to help with uh, the health and the safety and the welfare of the general public. So even these small little changes can help. And people sometimes don't know it like, oh, why does this feel different? Benches are turned one way, but it literally helps the health. Like, I mean, social interaction, like you're saying, it creates a healthier, you know, interaction, a healthier person mentally, physically. Um, I think it's just fascinating. So, oh, go ahead. I think it's a good point, right? A lot of people aren't even aware that design kind of conditions the opportunities for that to occur, for social interaction to occur or not to occur, right? So I don't think that it's really uh, like some of my friends or people I'll discuss like, well, do people want to hang out or do people not want to hang out? Or what about people who are introverted versus extroverted? And, And this isn't like an assault on introverts by any means. I'm not saying that people need to be quote unquote even more social. I'm just trying to provide the conditions so that that may occur and generate more good faith among people in our society, which is a democracy, which requires collaboration. So it's if we can just tweak our design so that there aren't a plethora of obstacles that prevent ourselves from interacting, I think there could be a lot of wonderful potential there. Yeah. And you're not forced to interact. I mean, even if you're sitting near someone, you can choose whether you interact or not. Um, that you saying that just reminded me, I can't remember what podcast it was on. It might've been a Ted talk. I'll have to find it. Um, but they did studies on like happiness and even the most introverted person, even just like saying hello to someone will make them feel happier. And then there was this, uh, train car study. Have you heard of this one that I don't know if it was in New York, I need to find out more info, but, um, they had, they separated it. So one train car would be like a social train car, like a, Mm, like a half hour. Yeah. Like a happy hour. Um, you could interact with people. It was meant to be like interacted with where all the other ones were, and it might've been subway probably made more sense, but, um, Mm. the other ones were how they normally are. It's usually you're packed full, but you're by yourself. And there was some flack like, oh no, people aren't going to want to do it. People are going to and from work. People just want to be by themselves. They don't want to interact. Well, then that train car ended up being like the busiest packed train car ever. And it was a a super success story. For some reason, I feel like they ended up having to cancel it or something, but I'll I'll find that and send it to you because it was fascinating. Please do. It's, It's exactly what you're saying. Like you don't have to go in that train car if you don't, but the amount of people that need that social interaction and are kind of thriving for it, 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 it's, it can lead to a huge success, even if it's just one train car within, or subway, I don't know, I'm, you know, San Diego, I don't know anything about yeah. <laughs> subways and trains, I don't know. We're not there yet, we're not there yet, yeah. maybe one day. We're, we're slowly getting there, but oh, that, yeah, it, but it, it, yeah. How can we create a friendly, more friendly society? That's essentially what I get at. I remember 
I probably should have mentioned this earlier, but one of the more influential museums I've been to, I was 17, I was in Tokyo. And I went to this museum and there was an exhibition where it was like a flower bed. And the purpose of the exhibition was that you, it was very interactive, which I enjoyed. And you're supposed to take the flower, leave the museum with that flower and give it to a stranger on the street in mm -hmm. Tokyo. And I remember being 17 and being like, wow, there's, I don't know what it is, but there's something that, that really excites me and attracts me to this, this concept. I'm not, I'm not sure what it is, mm -hmm. but this is, this is fun. This is, this is really cool. So like the train car experiment, I, I just want people to get along. That's, that's, yeah. that's kind of the goal. Yeah. And I think, you know, <clears throat> now more than ever and forever, just having conversations, it humanizes people when you're, mm -hmm. you know, behind and you're like maybe writing on a thing, it's easy to not connect, but just having that interaction humanizes, which makes you compassionate, which makes you understand other people's worldviews, which I think is huge for travel. It's why I've always been a big proponent of travel. I've loved international travel because you get huge, whole new perspectives, just even on how people eat or how people move. And it's, you realize like one is not better than another. It's just different. And so creating that, I mean, and we can do that here is just by talking to people from different cultures and yeah. Oh yeah. And traveling within the United States, this can be super mm -hmm. rewarding. I took a road trip pre COVID uh, from Tulsa, Oklahoma to San Diego and found it to be as culturally significant as my time in India or my time in Albania or anywhere else that I've been that's been culturally kind of distinct. So mm. plenty of opportunity wow. to communicate with people outside of your circle. Yeah. 100%. And I mean, our, it happens at the local level. There's plenty of people, I'm sure, even in La Jolla who I could talk to. That would be like, huh, that's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's good too. I mean, growing up in La Jolla, it tends to be a little bit of a bubble. So I it's mean, pretty bubble. Yeah. yeah. So it's good <laughs> to bubbly. Yeah, get around and uh, hear other people's stories and whatnot. So what have you found has been like the biggest challenge so far? Or what, what stage are you at? Are you just at the beginning of research or have you? So I have been researching my thesis for probably eight months now in a way. Oh, okay. And I've really come to this, this, this topic though, this, this, cause I was exploring a variety of ways in which how could humans come together? Let's facilitate social interaction. I've had, um, I think I'm on year six or seven now of kind of cataloging different basketball courts around the world. I was, when I was at Tufts, I played basketball with um, some of the local kids in Medford in the, in the neighborhood where Tufts was. And I would have, there was kind of this like education gap between Tufts and the local neighborhood. And that was an amazing way for us to bridge that maybe educational difference and, and hang out with each other. So that was another one of my preliminary, huh, this is a, this is a tool or strategy to get people to come together. Mm -hmm. So I took that and cataloged that with kind of through my travels, all these different basketball courts. And so this summer I used uh, geopolitical borders as kind of symbolic, symbolically rich symbols of division um, and drew a bunch of basically basketball courts and kind of places shared or unity spaces on various controversial borders. So my research has been cultivated in that way. And I was, but it wasn't until I actually had a conversation with um, a mentor of mine, Gordon Carrier, who's an architect here in San Diego. And he really inspired and pushed me to truly answer the question I'm asking. Is how can architecture bring people together? And not just skip to one of the plethora of ways in which that could be done, but hang out in that space of truly invest, like rigorously investigating what are the spatial variables that influence social interaction. So that conversation, I believe, was yesterday or two days ago. So in that context, I'm quite new to my topic, even though I've been every single studio or studio project I've done, and it has always been about bringing people together. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you need that one person to be like, you know, narrow it down or make it like, oh, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> Super helpful. It's always nice talking to people about your ideas. I it's it's interactive in that way. And it's, I think, super clarifying and, and iterative and helping drive your process forward. So when do you start, do you have to have, uh, like start designing? Is there, or do you not have any deadlines or anything like that? 
I have a, a white paper that's due in two weeks. It's supposed to kind of outline what my thesis is, what I intend to do, what's my methodology, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then my thesis can culminates, I believe, in early May. So I'm super stoked to spend the next six months every single day working on it. And yeah. quite frankly, this research, I hope to be lucky enough to continue for the rest of my life. I'm very interested in this topic. And I'm optimistic and excited that this thesis can kind of be uh, my foot in the door to the, I guess, maybe I already went through the entry door, my foot through the, the next door uh, of really kind of discovering how, what role I can have in architecture and other disciplines can have in nourishing social interaction with people. Mm -hmm. Well, and uh, it's kind of perfect timing too. It's probably more challenging with COVID, um, even in just like meeting with people and, and getting get you talking with people and doing the research. But it's, uh, it's almost more interesting because you can use that as, you know, studies and, and tools to, to increase the validity of why we need this and why it's important. Sure. And you know, it's interesting. COVID has been incredibly challenging for social interaction, but personally, I've actually I've been surfing a lot more since COVID started and I hang out in Del Mar a lot, kind of on the bluffs over there and through that Canyon. And it's been easy or it's been not easy. It's been, well, it has been easy to meet new people via that activity, but it's been interesting to see how we can maybe adjust and still the opportunities that exist for various social interaction. And then like we talked about earlier, yes, I can't like meet up with a person uh, with someone in person. Right. But now it's much more easy to access people across the globe in, I think, more um, sufficient means. I knew how to, everyone knew how to FaceTime before, right? But it was less of a norm. Mm -hmm. Like I FaceTime my friends. I wouldn't like just like randomly ask someone to FaceTime. Yeah. But I think that COVID has normalized that. So just trying to take the constraints of the times and run with it. And if anything, COVID has amplified the significance of you should probably interact. Although there are people who are like cities are the devil and that's what spreads you know pandemics and we should all move far far away so also trying to maybe mm, gently push back on that notion yeah i think uh with that though i don't mean this in like a patronizing way but i think it does come down to education because not in terms of like less educated more educated i just mean not educated in that subject because as an architect i took classes on urban development and healthy urbanism and th those sort of topics that most people don't actually do, you know, dive deep into. And with those studies, you find out that the city cities, you know, are, I mean, if you can develop them in a healthy way and stuff, but they are, they can be more healthy and everyone living in their own pod spread out actually leads to more pollution and, uh, you know, not as healthy Sure. Urban many sprawl, other variables. So. Yeah, many other variables to consider besides pandemics, and hopefully we can design our cities in such a way that pandemics aren't as threatening. But mm -hmm. that's to be explored, I guess. Well, I mean, we're not throwing pee out the window anymore in the cities, so it's gotten healthier. <laughs> Huge upgrade, progress. <laughs> yes, slowly but surely. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, <laughs> definitely in uh, May or June, we'd love to either have you back on or see progress or I don't know if they're doing their presentations virtual probably but that would I would cool assume so yeah no I would be delighted to come back on and, and and share hopefully some successful research yeah and even uh what worked what didn't you know what it's always good to it's that's been always part good of the to, success exactly. what, did, what, what does not work <laughs> exactly kind of talk about yeah we tried this it doesn't work it's always good to talk about that so you talked a little bit about uh, surfing and hanging out in Del Mar. So yeah, when you're not busy working on your thesis, is that, you know, what do you like doing? Is that basically it or what else? Uh, I'm a pretty curious person. I have uh, a lot of different passions I like to pursue, but yeah, surfing has been super fun. I really like to slackline. Uh, I do a lot of handstands and uh, gymnastics. I used to be oh, a nice. yoga teacher. So kind of taking that interest and in, in now applying it more in a, kind of specific calisthenics or strength-based gymnastics way. So yeah, I do a ton of fitness stuff with my dad and my brother and I like to play backgammon with my friends, Catan. Love backgammon. <laughs> uh, backgammon's amazing. It's the best. <laughs> we have a pretend Instagram account. I guess it's a real Instagram account called the Backyard Backgammon Club. 
So oh, I'm going to link it. <laughs> yep. Try and trying to start a movement. I'm, I'll happily plug the backyard back end club. And I'll also happily plug my favorite restaurant in the world, which is fish 101 of which I like to go to with my friends. Oh, I don't know that one. Where is that? It's, it's like humbly the best restaurant in the world. Oh. And that's just like a fact. <laughs> I guess if you don't like fish, you might be a little ostracized, but it, uh, their original location is Lucadia on the 101. Okay. That's why it's mm -hmm. called Fish 101. And then they re somewhat recently opened up a secondary location in Cardiff. Both okay. North County vibes. Yeah, we'll have to go there. We love yeah, North County amazing, and amazing love spot. Fish. Fish 101. Awesome. Okay, so where can people find you and support you? I'll link everything. So My Instagram is Ryan underscore Rosen. I've been beginning to post a little bit more on that platform. And my website is ryankrosen.com, where I have all my work. And I'm looking to probably produce a new website. So maybe you can share that with your listeners once it's created. That will be specifically on social interaction and mm -hmm. my thesis and trying to be as inclusive and interactive as possible and learning from everyone what they find to be successful and what they would like to use to kind of what would make them more socially interactive or likely to interact. Perfect. Awesome. We have a little bit of delay, but it's okay. We can still hear each other. So <laughs> right on, right on. All right. So, um, oh, your book. Can you plug your book too? Oh, sure. It's called From Within a Community by, by me, Ryan K. Rosen. It's available on Amazon. It's um, mostly a photo journal of some of my work in India. And basically what I was doing there is I was walking around a kind of rural town, semi-rural town called Amir with a bunch of eight-year-olds with the cameras every single day, going to various homes, restaurants, temples and other spaces throughout the uh, village. I mean, there's 400,000 people that live there. So they call it a village. I would more refer to it as a town. Um, so I think it's super exciting as far as an account into what that small area of Rajasthan was like in the year 2018, uh, as well as maybe if people are interested in traveling, insight into how you can be more interactive and engaging with local communities, which I think makes personal travel experiences more personally fulfilling and rewarding and as well as better contributes to local communities. Awesome. I love it. Very cool. Well, thank you, Ryan. I appreciate it. And uh, I will link it all and I appreciate your time. It was awesome. Sounds good. This is really fun, Bryn. Thank you for having me on. Thank you all so much for tuning in to listen to Ryan and I talk. I am so inspired by all the different things that he has said and and the different perspectives that he comes from. I think this idea of social interaction is so, so important, especially in today's climate um, and and figuring out how to do that in a unique and a healthy way. I think architects and urban planners and designers have a very important, um, basically social justice to create healthy environments for our people. So I really hope that you gain some value of that. I am sure Ryan would love to hear any perspective you have, anything um, that maybe you can contribute to his studying of this topic. So I will link all his information below. So please reach out to him and let him know that you found him here. And don't forget, do all the things, subscribe, like, review, do all the, you know, things that hopefully can help people find us. You know, it's a saturated world out there, so we can use all the help we can get. You can find us at Be Young Design on Instagram and now Twitter, which is very exciting, uh, beyoungdesign.com and Design Create Inspire anywhere you get your podcasts. All right, guys, have a good one. Bye.